I'm Mark Sponsor, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, June 20th. Storm Surf, waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, real data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. Looking at significant wave heights for the South Pacific Ocean, we see remnants of what was a pretty broad gale in the far Southeast Pacific. Another tiny system trying to get organized in the deep South Central Pacific, and another one trying to develop south of New Zealand, neither of which are, are expected to do a whole lot, but there is more forecast behind that. Let's get into the details. As usual, we'll start by looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales when they form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough that is a push in the jet to the north in the southern branch. This is the southern branch. This is the northern branch here. It is this branch that has all the influence in terms of generating storms, which of course generates swell. We're looking for the jet to push to the north, sort of like it is here under New Zealand. The ice line is somewhere around 63 or 64 south, that is south of this line. It's the Ross Ice Shelf, Antarctic ice. It doesn't show it on this chart, but it's there. And any kind of gale over ice does nothing. It has to, uh, you have to have winds blowing over exposed open ocean. All right, so right here, we're looking for a trough, and we see it. What that helps do is create a clockwise flow aloft and down at the ocean surface. That's the hallmark of low pressure. Of course, low pressure, if it's strong enough, generates winds. Winds, if they're strong enough, generate seas. Seas, as they radiate away from the fetch area, turn into swell. And swell, when it hits your beach, turns into surf. So, troughs are very important. The stronger, the better. The stronger the winds blowing up into them, the stronger the winds down at the ocean surface. All right, so moving into Sunday, the trough I mean, with the ice line being around here, it doesn't look like it's going to do a whole lot. It's still too far to the south. We get another trough in on Tuesday, pushing a little bit further north, up to about eh, maybe 55, um, 55 south. And that has a little bit better shot at generating some swell. Then we get into sort of a zonal flow when the jet is just running flat, straight west to east. And that doesn't really help to do a whole lot. That continues into Thursday and Friday. Maybe another trough developing over the central South Pacific on Friday evening, pushing into the Southeast Pacific. And then another stronger trough developing south of New Zealand as we get into Sunday towards the end of the model with uh, 150 knot winds feeding, almost 160 knots feeding up to this, up into it. This looks like it has some decent potential. But again, it's like a week out, so we don't always believe the model. So, but at that point in time, trough here, big trough here, almost out of the Southern California swell window. But look at this, the Southern branch pushing up to the Northern branch. They join forces way north, like at 36 south. The closer gales are to California or Hawaii for that matter, the less swell decay, the better the swell will be, especially if the storm is pushing north and the fetch is pushing, pushing north. So there is some more potential a week out. Not too bad from the upper level. Let's go take a look down at the surface. Here we are, surface level pressure, surface level winds, remnant gale off here, the, Cal the southern Cal swell windows and cuts off about 118, 117 west, so here, so this fetch is out of there. Good for Chile, Peru, Central America, not so good for California. Fetch developing under New Zealand on Sunday, 45 knots out of the west, not really aimed north up at Hawaii, and continuing off to the east as we get into Sunday night, sort of fading out, but another broader one develops on Monday night into Tuesday, 40, 45 knot winds aimed well to the northeast, uh, short-lived though, and then turning more west as we get into Tuesday night and Wednesday. That sort of fades out. And then we have another system Thursday, tiny little area of 50 knot winds, 55 knot lifting northeast. This and then south fetch in it is Friday. This one looks more promising. I mean, good long lasting crossing the South Pacific. Fetch aimed well to the north. The system itself doesn't push to the north, 
but it has a good amount of fetch aimed that way. We're almost a week out. We're Saturday night. And also notice another broad gale developing under New Zealand, the 40 knot southwest winds as we get into Sunday morning. Here we go. Remember when the jet, the two branches of the jet merged? Well, a week from now on Sunday, 35 to 40 knot fetch. I mean, that's good for eh, maybe 14 second period swell, but well to the north up at like 35 south. Aimed well at California, uh, Mexico, Central America. You get the idea. And then let's see. We've got another. Oh, it continues building to 45 knots. Now, I don't believe that for a second. We're all, we're a, a week out now, but another system under New Zealand. The short of it is things looking pretty good. If you believe the charts, if you believe them a week out. All that aside, there's already swell in the water. I mean, literally today there was. Nothing huge, but in Northern California, it was sets that were, you know, chest, maybe shoulder high, maybe some peaks a little bit bigger at top spots. Long waits between swell. There was literally nothing in the South Pacific for a week prior to the storm that generated the swell. So the only thing that was coming through other than local Northwest wind swell was just this one singular swell. So it was a set, a group of waves, five, six waves maybe, then nothing literally flatness and then 20 minutes later another five or six waves you know and sort of the standard southern he hemi deal but very clearly defined because there was not this uh, overlapping of multiple swell trains all right so the big story is starting sunday a week ago 13th of june new gale started building southeast of new zealand lifting a bit to the northeast covering a broad area with at least 28 foot seas Seas building as we got into Monday to 40.5 feet. We'll give it 39 feet. And not really pushing. Oh, there we go. There's a good 40 feet, maybe 41 feet. Mainly aimed off to the east, but a good secondary fetch behind it of 30 foot seas aimed off to the northeast. And then, then it started sort of falling southeast. Not so interesting. But then right behind it, a secondary fetch developed with, uh, seas pushing. What is that? About 40 feet again, 39, 40 feet over a small area, but kind of falling south. But there was south winds in this as well. So more more swell is expected from that. And then even this tiny little tertiary thing developed behind that with 24, yeah, about 24, 25 foot seas. The short of it is a long run of like an initial burst of swell Tuesday-ish kind of time frame. Actually, it starts on Monday, but Tuesday, Wednesday-ish. And then after that, just like this nonstop kind of dribble of two feet at 15 seconds, 16 seconds, 14 seconds, you know, like three foot surf, but at top spots, you can... I don't know that you get double that height, you know, maybe down on the top spot in Southern California, but let's say, you know, four foot, four and a half foot faces at top spots on the peak. So a, a long run of swell is expected. Then things sort of settled down, little dribbles of stuff here and there. It was at 20, 22, 24, maybe 25 foot season, multiple places. Again, that's just you know, okay, 26 foot, oh, we're out of the California swell window. That It's right now. That's east of the California swell window. But another little thing, trying to organize pushing under New Zealand. Moving on to the forecast now. That was all Honcast. That, all that, all that energy has produced swell that is all radiating, some of it towards Hawaii, more of it towards the U.S. West Coast, even more of it towards Central and uh, South America. Okay, and then we look forward and... Another little system developing under New Zealand. I mean, not a big system. Probably this one is a little bit better. 30 foot seas, 30, yeah, what's that? 30, 30 foot seas. That's not much for a New Zealand swell relative to California. Good for Tahiti though. Good for Hawaii and some energy from a preferred direction for Northern California and Southern California and continuing into Wednesday or so. That sort of fades out. Notice here's the ice line. What is that about? 63 there and about 66 south there you know see you sort of get the picture here and then another system this is the interesting one starting friday uh in the central pacific not big but lifting northeast 33 foot seas it says 34 continuing just sort of lumbering across the pacific lifting off to the northeast with 20 22 24 26 27 foot seas and well to the north 
That is interesting. Oh, building to 29 feet on Sunday. Again, a week out, the warning there. Oh, building to 34, uh, 30, this is, yep, 34.8 feet at 36 south 123. Good size south uh, angled swell if that were to occur. And again, the next one under New Zealand, you get the idea. Forecast looking good for the uh, working our way into nearly July. Um, there is hope. Nothing huge from any of this. Uh, significant class swell we typically call three feet at 17 seconds, which would be you know, top spots, two feet overhead or so on the sets and consistently. We really haven't had anything that we label a solid significant class swell this summer, but we've had a bunch of swells that were two foot overhead for a couple of sets for two hours at the right tide and, you know, the right place and blah, blah, blah. But nothing that, you know, all day long, it's just pumping with three or four foot overhead, uh, you know, type sets. So still, we're kind of in the modest category. And you can see that even on these systems. You know, you get barely 32 foot seas or you get 40 feet, but it's just over a tiny little area. It's all aimed at the east. None of that is, you know, what we're really looking for. The Rather, an aggressive 38 feet over a big area of seas aimed well to the northeast, then then that triggers the alarms for really solid, meaty southern hemi swell. But beggars can't be choosy. We'll take what we get looking pretty good. Next up, the wind swell machine. Well, high up, what do we got? Like a little surface low inland from just scorching heat the past couple of days in California. High pressure out at sea, 1028 millibars, standard summertime pressure gradient. The difference between the low and the high tightens the isobars, these little blue lines here, and that creates wind, 20, 25 knots. So there is wind swell, nothing huge right now. And that probably will be dying as we get into Monday. You can actually, here is the low pressure. You can actually see it, 1028, 1012 millibars. Normally it's like over land, but actually pushes out to sea. There's the high, close proximity. The high is pretty weak. The low is pretty weak. You get a little fetch, but all of it's aimed. It's a fish storm. Nothing really aimed at California or Hawaii. As we continue in, notice low pressure building in the Gulf of Alaska. All fetch aimed north of Alaska, nothing really at the U.S. West Coast or Hawaii. But given that it's the end of June, that is kind of interesting, especially given it's a La Nina year and all that. But I don't think it really means anything. Slack winds as we get into Wednesday. Thursday, we're looking for anything. I mean, that's kind of good. You know, if you got southern hemi swell coming, I don't, who wants a bunch of wind swell just mucking it all up? So then we get into Saturday, pure high pressure and control. You can see the wind start building along the coast. A little bit of fetch east of the Hawaiian Islands, good for some wind swell. Sunday, here we go. The standard just raging wind machine, 30, 35 knot winds off of Cape Mendocino. Actually, it's, it's pretty strong, so we're not going to belittle it. And 20 to 25 knots down to Point Conception. That's good for wind swell on Sunday. And even stronger, 35, I'm mean, almost probably pushing 40 knots there. That's solid indeed. But you notice that eddy flow thing. There's the low pressure again, right? So you have the high here, the low here. It circulates counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. The high clockwise, tightening up the isobars, north winds. And you got this Venturi effect just based on the geography of the land here. It like mashes it even more, creating stronger winds. But because the low is right on the coast, you get this sort of south wind thing going along here, which you know, does a lot to help take warm water further south, push it north. It doesn't allow for the upwelling machine like it does up here, and that might help warm water temperatures a little bit more. But I mean, as of right now, things aren't too bad. It's much better than it was a month ago. All right, let's move on. Now you're going, why are we looking at the snow forecast dashboard? Well, it has nothing to do with snow. It's all about temperatures at elevation. Hikers on the PCT, John Muir Trail, you know, the Sierra Trek, um, Warm temperatures are good, but too warm temperatures when you got 30 pounds on your back and you're trying to do 10 or 12 miles or 15 miles, or I guess some people do 20 miles a day at 12,000 feet and, and you're sweating your guts out, not a good thing. Snow level or the freezing level really is what we're talking about. Above 14,000 feet, that suggests that, you know, I mean, most of the highest peaks, the passes are what, maybe 13,000 feet, ranging between 11 and 13. So that suggests pretty warm temperatures 
cooling off a little bit, uh, what is that, the 21st through about the 24th, and then back to, to the uh, warm machine. Snow probably pretty well melted off, even some of the higher passes, but we haven't gotten any good data on that, but that's just based on looking at 9,000, 10,000 foot, the minarets, things like that. It's all It's all gone. We're a month to six weeks ahead of a normal schedule, which really isn't good. Not good uh, water availability on some of the trails. All right, let's move on. What's going on long term with the MJO, the Manjulian Oscillation, and the El Nino Southern Oscillation? As usual, we start by looking for signs of the active phase of the MJO. The MJO, the Manjulian Oscillation, comes in two flavors, active and inactive. There is only an active and an inactive phase in play at any point in time on the uh, face of the Earth, and the MJO is confined to the equator, five degrees north and south of the equator. But wherever the active phase is, north of it, almost up to, you know, 50 degrees north or 60 degrees north or south, it has effects on the weather. Because the MJO imparts energy to the jet stream, it feeds the jet stream, and that, of course, helps feed, create troughs, which then create storms, which create swell, etc., etc. But part two is when the active phase is over the West Pacific, it also can create, it reverses trade winds or can significantly stomp on trade winds, which allows warm water that's typically pulled up in the West Pacific because it's driven there by easterly trades across the equator, can allow that warm water to start pushing east under the equator in like a ball, a bubble of warm water. It takes three months to get from the West Pacific to the East Pacific, and then that warm water, it's called a Kelvin wave, it can erupt when the Kelvin wave impacts the Galapagos and Ecuador, which is exactly what's happening right now. Not strongly, but it is happening now, and that, create, and that can start warming waters off of Peru, Ecuador, Central America, that area, and if you get successive Kelvin waves driven by successive strong active phases of the MJO, which typically is enhanced by El Nino, that's kind of what kicks off the El Nino cycle. So we're very interested in the active phase of the MJO short term because it can help produce surf indirectly and long term because it can help get us to an El Nino pattern, which of course is always good for surf production and for water production in California. All right. So that said, let's go look at what's going on on the equator. Uh, this is data from the TAA buoy ray, series of buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino, but we're using it to check the MJO. We're looking at the arrows only. The colors are water temperatures. Of course, you can see colder water, warmer water, but the arrows, trade winds. The longer the arrow, the stronger the winds, pretty strong trades then in the East Pacific, moderate plus strength trades of the Central Pacific, and the Kelvin wave generation area, this West Pacific area. That's the equator here. There's the date line there. Kelvin wave generation area, again, five degrees north and south of the equator. That's New Guinea there. Out to a little past the date line, about 170 west. So in your mind, just draw a box right there. And that's where we want to see these arrows changing direction. But it's not the actual wind speeds. It's the relative to what is normal for this time of year. So we see strong trades here, but it's the anomalies. The difference from normal for this time of year goes, huh, you look, there's pretty much no arrows here. So that suggests these trades are normal. Okay, so that's good. That doesn't mean La Nina. It certainly doesn't mean El Nino either. In the Central Pacific, same deal. In the all-important Kelvin wave generation area, pretty much neutral. Maybe a little bit stronger out of the east in one little area here, but no clear signs of the active phase of the MJO. But the inactive phase would enhance the trades and make them stronger out of the east. So we see no sign of that either. Kind of a neutral pattern, it looks like, at least from this one chart. Let's go look at the forecast. All right, so we were all concerned on the last chart about the east and west component of the wind. So this chart is literally nothing but, e is it stronger from the east or stronger from the west than normal? The blues, stronger from the east, indicative of uh, the inactive phase of the MJO. The reds, yellows stronger from the west westerly anomalies all right now let's get oriented here is the date line this is the whole plan on one chart so the date line runs right up the middle okay the far west pacific starts about 135 east so right about there okay this is all past performance here you get the sense of 
Well, this is over in the Indian Ocean here. The, this area here is Indian Ocean, Maritime Continent. So that's the active phase of the MJO in the Indian Ocean. And it's supposed to be, or was supposed to be, traversing the Pacific, which maybe it did there. And then this looks like another inactive phase in the early part of June. And now here's where the end of June still looks like Easterly anomalies in control. Kelvin wave generation error, we said starts there, goes to 170 west, so right about here. Here's the, here's the, oops, here's the, uh, time frame we're looking at for the next week. Kind of a mixed bag. Westerly anomalies, easterly anomalies. Kind of no MJO signal at all. And that's possible too. You don't have to have the MJO. It can be very weak for months at a time, and that appears to be what's going on for the moment. But let's go look a little bit further out. If you don't get satisfaction in the next week, well, maybe we'll see something interesting two weeks out. All right, so here's another chart. Outgoing long wave radiation. Fancy words for cloud cover, okay? The reds and yellows and oranges mean lack of cloud cover, a lot of sunlight reflecting off the ocean. Well, the Inactive phase of the MJO is like high pressure, and high pressure typically suppresses precipitation, cloudless skies. So, oh, and let's get oriented here. Equator, EQ, running South America, Central America, Hawaii, New Guinea, Kelvin, uh, Australia there, Kelvin wave generation area roughly here, the West Pacific. There's your dateline right there. So a very weak inactive phase of the MJO and the Kelvin wave ge uh, generation area today Five days from now, ten days from now, two weeks from now, per the statistic model, okay? But there are multiple different types of models. The dynamic model, unfortunately, is telling us pretty much the same thing, but maybe a stronger version of the inactive phase a week to two weeks out. Okay, well, I'm not happy about that, but let's go look a little further. But before we do that, let's look at phase diagram charts. That tells us exactly where the active phase is, okay? We said the active phase moves from west to east, from the Indian Ocean over the Maritime Continent, over the West Pacific, East Pacific, underneath the United States, across the Atlantic, over North Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. Where the heavy dot is, is where the active phase is. So somewhere like North Africa, maybe the West Indian Ocean, if it's inside this circle, it's very weak. So a very weak inactive phase over in the West Indian Ocean per the statistic model and forecast to pretty much just noodle around there for the next two weeks. So no MJO, no active MJO signal in the Pacific at all for the next two weeks. The dynamic model pretty much suggesting the same thing. Active phase in the same place, noodling around over, we'll say, North Africa for the next two weeks. Darn, not good. That suggests that if the active phase is here, then the inactive phase is over here in the West Pacific. And that's exactly what we saw in the previous charts. Here's an upper level model. It goes out 40 days, okay? Each panel is uh, five days, eight different panels. South America, Central America, equator at zero right there. Okay, Galapagos, that one little speck there. Uh, New Guinea there, Australia, Kelvin wave generation area right there. Uh, so this is the yellows, oranges, not favorable for precipitation. And you get this sense, well, there's just in the Pacific, just sort of this mixed, undefined pattern. And then starting the 5th of July, inactive phase sort of setting up weekly, moving east, not a strong pattern with maybe a credibly weak, um, active phase developing in the West Pacific, oh, maybe somewhere around mid-July or so. The CFS model, and you don't see this very often, okay? This is, again, the east-west component of the wind. The solid contours here are the active phase of the MJO. Okay, dateline, sorry, reorient, dateline right there. Kelvin wave generation area starting about here out to about here. That's today. The reds, oranges, west anomalies, the blues, east anomalies, solid contour, active phase, dotted contour, inactive phase. You see it moving from, oh, I'm out of the picture here. Here, you get a look. Active phase, moving west to east across the Pacific, inactive phase. Active phase, trying to make it into the Indian Ocean, kind of halfway doing it and then falling apart. Inactive phase in the Indian Ocean, not even making it out of there. And then just kind of a nondescript pattern for the next month in the Kelvin wave generation area. Maybe some westerly anomalies around the 
3rd or 4th of July, but that's about it. Nothing clearly defined. So when in doubt, look further out. Just hoping, looking for anything that's like, give me an active phase, give me something to sink my teeth into and give me some hope, right? Okay, so the same deal, but the, uh, again, date line right there, but the forecast is up here. The past performance is here. You look at the forecast, and this is the CFS model, east-west component of the wind, winds. These are the, the yellows, oranges, westerly anomalies, the active phase, the MJO. Blues, easterly component of the wind, inactive phase, the MJO, roughly. Dateline runs right up the middle here. And what do you see in this whole thing? I see literally this hard line that runs right down about through the middle of the Kelvin wave generation area. On one side of the line, there's westerly anomalies. On the other side of the line, filling the... Into, so the uh, Ecuador is like right... You can see this. There's like a, almost a line here. That's the dividing line. So the whole East Pacific, Central Pacific is forecast full of easterly anomalies. That would mean significant high pressure over in the Gulf of Alaska as we get into September, right? And high pressure building probably in the Southeast Pacific as we get into later, like later in July. And then the act, the active phase, I don't know if I'd call it an active phase. It's just like a non-existent pattern. But this brick wall in the West Pacific, that might favor the area under New Zealand as we get late into summer. And, but then, and also the off of Japan in that area as we get into the fall. But the Gulf of Alaska certainly looks like a return of the, what they call the ridiculously resilient ridge. Massive high pressure filling the Gulf of Alaska to almost the date line. Let's overlay the MJO, see if we're even close to right. All right, again, same deal. The solid contours, active phase of the MJO. This is past performance. That was a good active phase there. Look, I went the whole way around the planet. The latest one in May made it to about the date line, fizzled out. Here you go into mid-July, just this weak nondescript pattern with westerly anomalies in spots, but just kind of a mixed bag of nothing. A very weak active phase in mid-July, and then somewhere in August, things wake up. Strong active phase, but it gets chopped off, can't even make it to the date line. Why is that? Low pass filter. This gives you your kind of general tendency for high or low pressure. We'll go right to the bad stuff first. So last winter, this dotted contour, high pressure bias, it was over the date line. That is the La Nina signal, if you've ever seen it. One, two, three, four contour lines. But that's been steadily fading. Uh, La Nina was declared dead in, I don't know, late May, early June by now. And you can see the high pressure bias is supposed to collapse almost to the California coast by about the 4th of July, 6th of July. And it looks really good until you get to about the end of July and all of a sudden, and this model's been steady about this, high pressure rebuilding, not one contour, but two contours as we get into September. Now, again, a word of caution. We don't believe a model a week out, much less three months out, but this model gives you a, a, a rough guideline of what's going on. Also, low pressure all last winter, locked in the Indian Ocean. It started making progress into the Kelvin Wave generation area, and it looks like it's about as far as it's going to go right now, which is about halfway through, halfway to two-thirds through the Kelvin Wave generation area. It'll hold into about the end of July, and then it retrogrades. So what does all this mean? And it sort of reestablishes itself more in over the maritime continent or even in the Indian Ocean. What does this mean? Well, it looks like a return of La Nina for the fall and winter, but not nearly as strong as what we're seeing here. Just sort of like a shadow of itself, and it typically does it. You get one year of strong La Nina, looks like it's going to fade, then it'll wake up again and sort of come back for the fall into the early part of winter, and then it'll finally die for real come January-ish or so. But the problem is, well, we'll see. We'll see. You know, I mean, we got another three months to go. We'll see how this all plays out. But I suspect the first part of fall is going to be pretty meager. But once things collapse, things might wake up. So maybe a slow start to the winter. But come January, something like that, maybe we'll be on a roll then.
So with that, let's look and see what's going El Nino, La Nina wise. First off, by looking at sea subsurface temperatures. This is the East Pacific here, West Pacific here. This is down 100 meters, 200 meters, 300 meters. How do we get that data? These are the actual anchor lines on the TAAO buoys. The X's are sensors on those anchor lines. They collect data, send it up to a, a data center in Maryland. They apply a model to it, fill in the gaps. You can start seeing a profile. The 29 degrees centigrade temperature line, it's been holding steady about 170 to 178 east for a while. The 28 degree isotherm, it's been steady for a couple of weeks at 160. It actually looks like it's trying to backtrack. It's sort of hanging on the surface, but at depth, it looks like it's almost back to about 163 west, something like that. Of course, the 24 degree isotherm, though, quite solid, quite steady, pushing the whole way in, meaning that warm water is making its way across to Ecuador. In the winter, this was all cold water right here. So we're much better off than we were last winter. And we suspect that this, the, you know, even if sort of this weak La Nina thing does redevelop, it's not going to completely unlodge all this warm water. Now, anomalies, differences from normal for this time of year. We see warm water, one degree, two degrees centigrade. And we're kind of watching this line to see if this isn't some sort of a weak Kelvin wave trying to move off to the east. It is at 157 something like that it hasn't moved a whole lot lately and there hasn't been a strong enough active phase of the mjo to really make us believe that this is making strong progress off to the east but there were two previous kelvin waves they have produced uh warm water that was over here all balled up made it the whole way across the pacific currently pushing into ecuador uh impacting the surface to what is that about 125 west, so south of California, the whole way into Ecuador. Still another month and a half's worth of warm water there. And yeah, cold water at depth, but it's really like this 150 meter line that's really what, really what matters. It's a little bit deeper. And so no sign of like the reverse of a Kelvin wave, like a cold water Kelvin wave. Uh, just a generic, a little bit better than generic warm water pattern. No sign of La Nina subsurface. That's exactly what we want. A higher res model suggesting pretty much the same thing. This is that thing that we're thinking maybe is a developing Kelvin wave here. We're keeping our eyes on it. And this is the old Kelvin wave. We think warm water that they've been showing, this model is just consistently showing this little pocket of cold water here. But we think things are more in line with what this model is showing that it's just pretty much continuous into Ecuador, and that this doesn't really exist. Upper ocean heat anomalies, another way to look at this thing. So this is the West Pacific here, East Pacific here, and you can see blues are colder than normal temperatures, reds warmer than normal. Last August, the development, actually it started in April, very cold water, strong easterly trades, massive upwelling in the East Pacific, what? blowing from this direction to this direction, you see warm water steadily building, building, building the far west Pacific, just driven by raging trades. And then we got the active phase of the MJO in February, another one in April. Trades relaxed, boom, one Kelvin wave. Boom, another Kelvin wave. They weren't super strong. I think, you know, and I don't have a lot of data on this, but the stronger the westerly anomalies, the more velocity the Kelvin wave has, the faster the warm water moves off to the east, and the better its odds of traversing the entire Pacific and making it into Ecuador. You notice they both kind of stalled at about 90 west. We know there was a bunch of cold water and other stuff going on here, which probably didn't help the situation. Right now, you can see it kind of dribbling into Ecuador, but not particularly strong. And then here's what we think is this next Kelvin wave. The trouble is, see how much warm water was there in the west? and see how much there isn't there now, meaning even if we did magically get some great active phase of the MJO, there's not a lot of warm water to create another Kelvin wave. The point being, these one, two, three Kelvin waves might have completely discharged the whole bubble, and that sets you up then again for this uh, La Nina-ish like winter. Even if you get active phases, you're not going to get any warm water and that sort of feeds. The, and then you end up with something like this and that the cold water does not support evaporation, with then, which then starts feeding high pressure buildup over the Pacific and then your whole house of cards starts falling down.
And just one more chart, upper ocean heat anomalies for the dateline to a point, you know, somewhere south of Mexico, somewhere. But you get the general idea here. Colder than normal temperatures, half, uh, I mean, almost one degree, 1.3 degrees, you know, again, about one degree. And then magically in March, as the Kelvin waves started pu pushing across the Pacific, the balance turned to warmer than normal temperatures over, you know, the whole central and east Pacific. But now you can see the balance of that warming fading off some, returning to a neutral pattern, which is fine. You know, but it's way better than this. So this is not doom and gloom. It's just, you know, we're not off to some El Nino start is what I'm trying to say. We're just trying to get back to normal. And even though the ocean's doing all its thing and kind of, you know, returning to normal, the atmosphere above it is not normal at all. I mean, you can just see it in the, the quality of the storms this, this summer and what the jet stream is doing and a host of other things. The atmosphere... The, the oceans have to change and hold for five or six months before the atmosphere starts turning, and then it takes another couple of months. So, you know, if you've been La Nina for a while, the odds are you're going to sit La Nina for a while until it's just run its cycle and then everything collapses and then you go the other way. Quick look at surface temperature anomalies, sea surface temperature anomalies, okay? Uh, South America, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, the Galapagos, uh, Central America, Mexico, Baja, California, Hawaii dangling out there, Dateline somewhere over there. Yellows and oranges warmer than normal. So here is that Kelvin wave weekly erupting around the Galapagos, Ecuador to a point, you know, we'll say south of Baja maybe, you know, but then the trades are blowing here. So they're taking this warm water and pushing it off to the east. And you're getting this generalized warming, isolated warming thing going on here on the equator, which is good. But you notice the big blue here. You see that, you go, oh, that's great. Now, all that means is there's strong high pressure out here. And in the center of high pressure, there's dead air, no clouds. So you get the sun warming the ocean, which is good. But out on the edges, that pressure gradient we are talking about, and, and winds rotating around the high, and the high being stronger than normal because of La Nina, well, a lot of upwelling, a lot of churn in the ocean, pulling cold water from depth. The good news is, it doesn't look nearly as bad as it has been. There's even pockets of warm water showing up, certainly Southern California, but even up into Northern California, temperatures have pretty much returned to normal. And if we get some south winds, the more south winds we get, you know, that eddy flow we were talking about, that'll warm things up even more. But in general, sort of a generic, neutral to slightly above neutral temperature pattern, uh, certainly not El Nino or anywhere close to it. The trend for the past seven days, same deal, pretty much neutral. Yeah, a little pocket of cooling here, but it was actually warming the week before that. A little pocket of warming there, but no wholesale trend. But you can also see here, though, warming temperatures, at least the past week, over, we'll call it all of uh, the Baja area, Southern California, up to maybe the south tip of Monterey Bay, something like that. And then a little bit cooling in the Bay Area. And then, you know, that's all. What, but what really matters is right in here on the equator, mainly right here. The backed off views, same sort of pattern, light warming in the East Equatorial Pacific, fading over the central, and then warmish over the west Pacific, upwelling off of California, upwelling off of Chile, but nothing one way or the other, sort of late stages La Nina, trying to move out of it, but nothing indicative of El Nino. Sea surface temperatures in the Nino 1.2 region actually coming up as the uh, Kelvin wave has been erupting, erupting plus 80 one thousandths of a degree above normal, basically dead neutral, but we've been negative for since March, and we were negative before that. So trying to get back to the normal driven by the Kelvin wave. The official El Nino monitoring region, the Nino 3.4 region, the area from south of California on the equator to about the dateline, temperatures coming up slowly, uh, 193 thousandths, almost two-tenths of a degree above normal. And they've been sitting there since, so oh, 
June 7th or 8th, well, actually about the 9th or so. So, you know, what, 11 days. That is certainly not a trend. But looking over the long haul, temperature is definitely heading up. This is what we want to see. We want to see temperatures above the zero degree mark, um, slightly warm, but preferably much warmer. But we're not going to see that. If anything, they'll probably dip back down as we get into fall. So, does the atmosphere sense that anything is going on in the ocean, this warming that we're talking about? Does the atmosphere know what's going on? Well, we think probably so. Uh, we look at the Southern Oscillation Index, difference in pressure between Darwin, Australia, and Tahiti. When pressure is lower in Tahiti, which is in the Pacific, then the index goes negative. Darwin's sort of like over the Indian Ocean. When the index is positive, that means higher pressure in the Pacific, and that means more than likely La Nina. Today, minus 16.38, but it's certainly not a trend because we were, you know, plus 24, what's that, six days ago or something. So we uh, will say negative, but certainly not a trend. 30-day average takes the, no the noise out of it, minus 2.66. And looking back, well, you see we went from plus 6. We were actually at plus 19 at the peak of La Nina. We're now below normal, which is exactly where we want to be. So that's moving in the right direction. And then the long-term trend, the 90-day uh, average, which is sort of your El Nino La Nina indicator, 1.71 weekly positive. We were down at 1.06, and that was about the lowest we've been. So hovering right around zero, just one or two above. We were at plus 15 or 16 at the peak of it. So we're moving. We're in a pretty good place. We're officially, I'd say this is neutral um, atmospherically, but clearly we're seeing just the strength of the high pressure in the Gulf of Alaska and some of these sorts of things. And the upwelling pattern still suggests La Nina. So even though this is saying we're neutral, I'm not completely buying that either. We're still biased La Nina. You can see the 30-day moving SOI on the graph here, right here, negative, where we want to be. Back in 2019, we were in a weak La Nina state. Then we moved slowly, I'm sorry, a weak El Nino state. Then we moved slowly across the line into the El Nino state in, oh, I mean, even in April of, uh, was it April of 2020 we started, but the, it took the SOI a while to catch up, okay? And now we're heading back down. The question is, can we get down low enough so when we do get into the fall and if we do get into that high pressure regime, will it keep this sort of hovering around the neutral? Hard to say, but for right now, not a horrible place to be. So where are we supposed to be, you know, six months or more from now? The CFS version 2 forecast for sea surface temperatures in the official Nino 3.4 region. Today, we said we're about neutral, and that's what the model's saying. The solid line is past, er, is past performance. Here's the forecast saying, so the, this, the July line right here is really the middle of July. So from, we should be holding till about the middle of July. And this model says dipping back down to minus 0.85 of a degree, which is in La Nina territory, but you got to be there for five months. And this is only October, November, December, and January, and then coming out of it. Um, and this model tends to exaggerate a little bit too much. I suspect a bunch of other models are suggesting somewhere between zero and a half degree below normal. That's probably half a degree below normal is where we'll be, which isn't horrible. I mean, that's if it's La Nina, it's just barely La, La Nina territory, and we're hoping we don't get here, but this model has actually done a fairly reasonable jo job of predicting months to six months out where we're going to be. So we're saying this is probably approximates reality, but, but you know, subject to change and with a healthy do dose of skepticism. So the good news is there is swell in the water today, nothing huge, bigger swell coming, and then a long run of modest southern hemi swell beyond that, mainly for California, but bits and pieces for Hawaii, and then a series of gales forecast, don't know whether we believe the models, but up to and including a week out from now. So it looks like there's going to be steady not epic, but certainly rideable surf for two weeks, three weeks from now. 
which you really can't uh, get too upset about. You know, anything's good. Beggars can't be cheesy, so we'll take it. Long term, not so sure. The fall, not look. You know, once the Southern Hemi shuts down, I'm kind of worried a little bit about the fall. But, you know, if the Southern Hemi keeps providing surf, we'll, we'll go with that, whatever it takes, right? And then maybe as we get into the January time thing, things will waken up and, and we'll be back in a semi-normal groove. But, but who knows? We'll just have to see. It's a long, long ways from now. The immediate future, though, is looking pretty good. In case you hadn't noticed, we are, uh, cleaned up the studio a little bit. We're still working on things. Uh, yeah, you see some music stuff in the background. That's, that's a, another alternate life that I have, uh, not all of it good, but, but it's fun to do. And uh, other than that, yeah, um, we'll maybe do another view. You can see some of the little mini servers we got running in here and some other things going on that support Storm Surf. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, give us a thumbs up. Um, comments always welcome. We try to reply. Sometimes we get some good discussions going. If you don't understand something, shoot us a, shoot us a line there and we'll reply. Um, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, ring the bell. Uh, you'll get automatic notifications when we uh, publish the video. If not, go to stormsurf.com. We are running on our new faster server now. It seems like every year they, they force us to upgrade, and but every time it seems to be getting better and better and more stable. Technology is amazing, isn't it? All right, and uh, um, if not, go to stormsurf.com. We put, post links to the top page, every page of the website when we do the video, and you can get it there. All right, so that's it for this week. Go surfing. Have some fun. We'll do this again next week. Same time, same channel. Thanks for watching.